Hello and let's talk about the judiciary. Now the judiciary is often seen by a lot of people as a last resort in a country like India. A lot of responsibility lies on the judiciary, especially when it comes to checking the power and excesses of the executive. In recent times though, many have asked if it is fulfilling its vital duty as a pillar of our democracy. The recent Prashant Bhushan case was one such instance where many such concerns were raised by lawyers and common people in society. But this is not just about one case but a larger trend. What can the judiciary do to address such concerns and restore confidence in the minds of democracy-loving people? How can the judiciary be reclaimed by the people? Two of very, India's very eminent members of the legal fraternity, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court Madan Lokur and Indira Jaya Singh, Senior Advocate in the Supreme Court of India, discuss the issue. First, getting the impression that uh, we, the judiciary in this country, is silent for want of a better word. And as so far as I know, the only means that are available to citizens at the end of the day is to approach the judiciary if for relief in situations of this kind. And if the judiciary goes silent, hear no evil, see no evil, speak nothing, then do we, do we have a way of reclaiming the judiciary for ourselves and for the people of this country? I'd like to ask you this final question. How do we reclaim the judiciary and bring it back to its core function of delivering justice? Yeah, you see, I, uh, I, I have uh, expressed a view on uh, more than one occasion that our judiciary should introspect, right? There should be a dialogue. If the judiciary thinks what they're doing is right, perfectly okay. You know, have, have a dialogue, have uh, an introspection. If you come to the conclusion that what we are doing is okay, you know, a lot of people are talking a lot of nonsense. Fair enough. If you think on introspection and dialogue, you know, with uh, amongst themselves or amongst others, lawyers and so on, that you know, something more needs to be done. Fair enough, do it. You know, but not doing anything or apparently, apparently not doing anything because I, I don't know if uh, something is happening or not. But apparently not doing anything is not helping anybody. You know, I, I very strongly think that it, it is, it is, the time has come there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, criticism, so to speak, uh, about uh, the judiciary. You know, it, it may be valid, it may not be valid. I'm not going into that. But as long as it is there, you know, it, it is time for the judiciary to sit down and uh, introspect. I'm not only talking about the Supreme Court. It could be the High Court. You know, maybe some strange decisions have come from a particular state you know, or the uh, district judiciary of a particular state. The high court judges need to sit down and say, you know, why, why are we getting these strange orders? You know, it could be any state. But I think that, uh, you know, introspection, trying to find out, you know, are we on the right track? I think that's very, very important. Mm. Very interesting suggestion. I think uh, some kind of a some kind of a self audit uh, by the judiciary yeah. of its own functioning from the point of view of uh, rule of law yeah which which is in my opinion the core function of the judiciary how does how do you maintain the rule of law and that if there could be a judicial audit even if it is a self audit even if as you say, the judiciary, if they introspect even within themselves, if they could come up with some understanding of, of where do they stand on the issue of rule of law, uh, that for me is a very interesting suggestion that you're making. And you, you see, uh, take sedition, for example. You know, why is bail being denied to people uh, on the ground of sedition? Now, it, it is something which I think a lot of people in the legal profession are talking about. Is it not possible for the judges of the High Court or of the Supreme Court or whatever 
to sit down and say that listen why is it happening you know and is it right you know should should bail be declined if it yeah, if, if, the, if they come to the conclusion that yes bail should be declined fair enough but if they come to the conclusion that bail should not be declined and it is being declined some corrective steps will need to be taken so yeah in, introspection is necessary unfortunately just as lokur an impression has grown ground in the media and among the public that judges have become executive minded what is what they deliver is what the ruling parties or the governments of the day want them to deliver this is the sad reality that we are faced with after having devoted our life to the judiciary you as a judge me as a practicing lawyer and it makes me at least hang my head in shame yeah there, there is yeah people have said that uh, the judiciary has been execu executivized but then yeah think about it our next segment is a conversation between writer vijay prashad and musician roger waters amid the doom and gloom of our world the hunger the war the corporate greed and the violence the coups the suppression of people move people's movements and environmental degradation how does one find hope Vijay and Roger Waters talk about the latter's iconic work the Gunner's Song and finding hope in this context circling quickly back to uh, the Gunner's Dream again you know final cut 1983 uh, this is a period when Ronald Reagan is in the white house when um, the dirty wars in central america have picked up once again a cycle of dirty wars um, it's a very depressing period and in a sense we keep seeming to fall into these depressing periods in cycles but back in a depressing period there is not necessarily a dirty war in central america but there's this terrible hybrid war against venezuela um there's a blockade on cuba um there is just so much that's distressing in the world where do you go to pull hope from uh you know what keeps you going from a song you wrote in the 1980s to songs you're writing now they're songs about the horrible things of the world but they're also songs of hope where do you go to find that what the hope that's that's the hardest quest of all to keep a grip on hope is really difficult how do i do it i do it by being um looking at the microcosm really i i i say for all right let me tell you this there's a bloke in texas who through through one of my correspondents email correspondents i discovered who who was who he's he's a a vet he's a vietnam vet he's been a political activist blah blah blah, blah, blah. He had a couple of strokes a few months ago so and it came to my attention so i looked into him to see if he was real or not i decided he was real and he was crowdfunding and i don't know why he he was looking to raise 20 grand or something and he raised you know 3 or something like that and um i read his story and looked into him and then checked with somebody who knew him they said this guy is 100% really good man you know but so i decided to help him so i sent him money <laughs> and let, I'm not going to tell you his name because it might embarrass him and it gets complicated but so um first of all he changed his after he'd accepted it he changed his um bank details because he suddenly panicked and thought I might be trying to steal money out of his bank account <laughs> so we had to go through it all again and I had to somehow convince him that I was real you know which I did Anyway, I've I've remained in contact with him and it's only been a few months. That's it. And um I sent him a, I showed you a picture of our new puppy. I sent him a picture of that puppy because I know he's a dog owner. And uh, it was the day after um Gins Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And I said bummer about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and he sent me this very eloquent letter back desperately um unhappy about the loss and the monumental loss of this great wonderful woman and uh, terrified of what may happen you know if um if the supreme court uh, suddenly turns into 63 and is like that for the next 10 years or something 
And blah, blah. Um, what am I trying to tell you? Oh, but also, there's a bit of chat in this letter. He said, thank you again, and blah, blah, blah. He said, um, he said, my house is old and falling down and this and that. Yeah, but, but he said, with the help you've given me, I'm turning two rooms uh, into lettable space for two immigrant families so that they've got somewhere warm and dry to put their feet up for a fraction of the money they're paying in the awful places that they're living at the moment. So he says, that's part of what I have here. So he says, so we're turning now into a sanctuary. He said, that, so I'll have two immigrant families and also um, I've been providing shelter for women who've been raped in the army by good old US soldier boys. <laughs> and who are getting no, none of the help and support they need from the VA and so so on and so forth. So here's this guy, he's had two little strokes and he's still bursting and bubbling with love for his fellow human beings. Well, that's what you are, that's where you find your hope, is in little small personal stories about people who demonstrate that the gunner's dream lives on. And it, it would only have to be happening between one dreamer, who's also an activist and who acts upon the gunner's dream, and somebody who needs it. Because it's the relationship between the helper, giver, whatever, and the person, and the, and the person in need, in this case, immigrants with nowhere to live or whatever. It's, it's that symbiotic relationship that it becomes a furnace of joy for everyone in it. And that is where hope springs. You know, I feel quite emotional even talking about it. Like all you need is that one little thing and you go, you know what? This is worth it. You have to keep fighting. You have to give by however small the ripples may be when you drop your pebble in the pond, they are going to reach other ripples or the, they're going to reach the shore somewhere and everything is a cause and has an effect. So you have to believe the dream is that your, your pebble means something and it doesn't matter how much it is. What matters is that it's a pebble of love. That's all that's important. And when, and when you get an echo that comes back out of the darkness, you know, another, a ripple, you feel that tiny ripple from another pebble of love and you go, this is worth it. This is worth every ounce of energy that you put into it. Not least because if you're the two stroke guy and you're helping people, you're getting, you're getting, you're almost certainly getting more out of it than the people who are so grateful to you for giving them a roof over their heads. Because that is the nature of the collective. That is the nature of community. That is the, connect that is the nature of loving one another and trying to help one another. So that's why hope is. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from the country and the world. Until then, keep watching NewsClick. Thank <laughs> you.